Well, welcome to the fourth Delta Marketing Workshop. We are doing a mixed bag today. We have all kinds of things to talk about. This is the fourth one in a series that we've done. It's the, also the final. Uh, these workshops are really kind of, you know, high level intro workshops on how to market your business or organization. Um, it is geared for people who have businesses or organizations in the Delta, but certainly um, this can help any business leader as well. So we hope that you'll share these workshops with others that you know you think might benefit from this information. We already did some introductions. We have a little bit of a small group today, um, but I do want to introduce myself. My name is Stacy Hayden. I'm the Information Officer with the Delta Protection Commission. I also help support the Visit CA Delta website, which is a recreation and tourism website to share all of the many amazing things about the Delta with the rest of the world. So we have many things we're going to be talking about today. One of those is business chambers and visitors bureaus and how joining those can help benefit your business. Uh, we're going to talk about listing directories, what those are, best practices. We'll talk about email campaigns, text promotions, we're going to touch on search engine advertising, and then also a little bit of guerrilla marketing. If some of these things aren't familiar to you, we're going to talk about what they actually are as well. And moving forward, I do want to say as I go through this workshop, I am going to mention um, services from other businesses online, uh, businesses maybe in the Delta. I just want to remind everybody, as I have in previous workshops, that I'm not necessarily endorsing any particular business service or product. I'm just mentioning them. It's really important that you do the research that you need to do for your business or organization to make sure that any of the tools or actions that you're taking make sense for you. I will be answering questions towards the end, but if you need to ask a question just to clarify something along the way, please, by all means, if you could just raise your hand in Zoom. I believe star six is mute and unmute and star nine, if you're on the phone, is for um, raising your hand. I could have that backwards, <laughs> uh, but it is one of those two. So let's jump right in. There are a number of ways that you can get your organization out there into the world. We've talked about setting up your website. We've talked about social media. We've talked about the ways that you can do things in person to help spread the word. There's a lot of other avenues out there. And one of those is getting involved with your business chambers and or visitor bureaus. There are a number of them because they can be regional um, or they can be local. And so you can join you know, at different levels. Business Chamber of Commerce are organizations that typically look out for businesses um, in a particular locale. Um, and these can actually be national, state, and local chambers of commerce that are available out there. So locally in the Delta, almost all the towns, the larger towns, um, and then especially the more metro areas like Antioch and Pittsburgh, Stockton, all have chambers of commerce. Some of the smaller areas like Isleton does have a chamber. Rio Vista also has a chamber. So they are great organizations that you can get involved with to help support your business. We'll talk a little bit more in just a moment what some of those benefits and activities might look like. On the other side of uh, this discussion is visitor bureaus. And there is a lot of similarity between business chambers and visitors bureaus. In fact, some really do both. Um, it's not uncommon, but some tend to focus a little bit more on one or the other, just depending on that particular organization. Visitors bureaus really focus on kind of education and resources to promote whole communities, whole regions, mostly to travelers who are coming from outside of the area into that region. So it's really about promoting travel, although sometimes it really can be about promoting you know, kind of that local travel throughout a region as well, such as getting people to go to events within their own community. 
Examples of visitor bureaus on a regional level would be Visit California and Visit Stockton. And there's another one I'm going to discuss as well, but there are many. So I want to kind of give you these links so you can start thinking about these as avenues of organizations that you might be able to connect with. There are differences in even how visitor bureaus work. Visit California is much larger, of course. It's con looking at the whole state. It's not as focused on promoting businesses, for instance, that travelers could go to. It's really focused on overall experiences that you can have throughout the state, like getting into the you know, national parks and you know, getting outside types of activities that people can do. They do touch on businesses a bit sometimes, but it's not necessarily their main focus. Where something more local like Visit Stockton does focus a lot more on businesses as well as local events. So if you have events or you have a business, there's opportunities here to engage with either your chambers or your visitors bureaus. The benefits are numerous and I have just a few here. Um, of course, we're always just trying to you know, get the word out about our business. That's the main goal, right? Um, but there's some unique things about business chambers and visitors bureaus. When you can make business contacts, it's really an opportunity to learn about other businesses, possibly engage locally with other businesses that might support your business, for instance, kind of that networking opportunity. Um, to learn about what's around you and have those other businesses learn about your services and products as well. And, and sometimes the network opportunities really are, you know, more than just being able to see what's on their website. A lot of visitor bureaus and chambers will actually have networking events that you can go to in person and actually meet people and you know, discuss your service more, find ways to work together, share ideas. There's a lot of great opportunity there. Most of these will have newsletters that are gonna share information about events that are coming up, information about the region, the community that might be important to you. They might share um, educational resources that will help you grow your business. So usually um, these chambers and visitors bureaus really are a resource that are offering up information to help support you along with their other offerings as well like for instance having a website that they can list your business or organization on which goes kind of into that acquiring customer referrals um, these are a great way for people to find your business or organization via the chambers and visitors bureaus and sometimes like these chambers and visitor bureaus are so active that they're getting calls and they can actually, you know, say, well, here, this is the business then that you're looking for in the area, you should go to them. So sometimes there's very direct customer referrals to your business. Um, also, the benefit is it brings credibility to your business. You want other people talking about your business. Having a website's great. Having your own social media and talking about your business is super important. Having other organizations talk about your business is going to help lend credibility to your business. Next one is increase visibility in the community and beyond. Um, so again, this is what we're all doing with marketing. We're trying to increase visibility. But the idea here specifically is to increase visibility maybe in market areas, in audiences that you're not necessarily working with currently or thinking about or have reached into yet, where these chambers and visitor bureaus may have other target markets that they're connected to that they can introduce your business to, for instance, travelers. And then a very unique thing as well that can be beneficial in joining these and getting involved with these is you might be able to gain a voice in government or relevant projects. Um, oftentimes, you know, these entities will come together as a unit to provide public comment on projects to support certain business or travel friendly legislation. Um, so it allows a little bit of a resource. Again, it depends on, you know, what organization you might be working with, but often there is, you know, some of those discussions happening internally within the organization that then that organization can go and share the views um, that the members, for instance, might want to, to have out there in the world to benefit them. 
I am going to turn it over now to Bill Wells. He is actually a chamber and a visitor bureau. And so he is representing the entirety of the California Delta, which makes him a regional um, organization that you can get involved with. And Bill's gonna share a little bit about what he feels are the benefits of joining your chambers and the different ways that you can get involved and a little bit more about the chamber himself and anything else he would like to share. So why don't you go ahead and take it away, Bill? Okay, thank you very much, Stacy. Um, just a little background on uh, our chamber. We are Chamber and Visitors Bureau, which I remind people all the time. Um, we, we're, uh, we're incorporated in California as a nonprofit in 1969, so we've been around for over 50 years. And over the years, we've had some fantastic business leaders of the Delta uh, involved in our organization, uh, uh, insurance leaders. Our current president's Fred Weibel, who bottles wine for many, many uh, wineries around the Delta, including his own. Um, and and uh, with our main leader for many years was Hal Shell. If you're not familiar with him, uh, he was a uh, writer, editor, uh, and had his own radio show down in Stockton. But he was probably the biggest advocate of the Delta over the last 30 or 40, actually 40 or 50 years, I'll say. But uh, Anyway, that Hal has passed away now, and uh, uh, likewise many of the other people. So we're we're moving along, and uh, we're proud that we've been here so long. And I just like to show you maybe a few examples of things we do over the years. This is a uh, Delta map. Uh, we publish it uh, periodically whenever we can raise the funds. So they're very popular. We sell them out, give them away. Um, this is a, a Delta booklet. We publish this approximately every two years. Uh, it's paid for by the advertisers and we pass these out free all, anywhere we can. We print about 20 or 30,000 copies at each time. Uh, over the years, we've had a lot of really good relationships with local publications and newspapers, but they've all uh, pretty much <laughs> changed formats. Uh, a lot of our uh, Writers like Mike Fitzgerald have retired and moved on to other things. And uh, so there's not too many publications around. However, we do have a good relationship with Ben Delta Yachtsman Magazine. I write a monthly column for them. They allow me the space to do whatever I want. So uh, basically we're, we, we do cover the entire Delta. In fact, we have people, we have a member in uh, uh, Ohio and uh, members down in the uh, Bay area that, uh, see the good work we do. Um, but the, Bay, the many people don't realize how big the Delta is. I mean, it's from Tracy to the Straits of uh, Carquinas to Sacramento to Stockton. I mean, it's a huge area um, and it's divided by two rivers, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin. So it's not an easy drive to get around, but again, we pretty much cover everything. So um, what we, like to do is work with people and we a lot of starting businesses come to us and we've got a, a lot of expertise in business uh, six, every one of our uh, directors is a manager or owner of a successful area of business so we've got an untold amount of expertise we can offer people and i'd say from my own standpoint I, I can meet with somebody for half an hour or so and tell them how their how their business is going to survive and so we do our, our absolute best to help anybody we can. Over the years, uh, some of the other chambers, the, our, the, our organization was conceived to combine all the chambers, but over the years, uh, some other chambers have uh, dropped out like uh, uh, Clarksburg, uh, Cortland, uh, Walnut Grove. So we pick up the calls for them and try to help out wherever we can. And, and again, over the years, the uh, phone company somehow has gotten us as associated with the word Delta. So anybody that calls with some kind of random question and to the uh, to information, they transfer the call to us. So we get a lot of really <laughs> interesting calls from people. And uh, as a matter of fact, we send we send literature to Europe and uh, Australia, uh, all over the place for people wanting to, to visit the Delta. We've had voters uh, from Australia come up and we send them a package of information. So I think we, we do quite a bit of good work. Um, 
And uh, so currently, I guess we've got about 200 business members and we've got about between 50 and 75 booster members or associate members that just want to hang around with us. So in summary, that's kind of what we do. Uh, maybe I could ask a few or answer a few questions. I have a question for you, sure. Bill. Sorry, my audio might be a little weird there. Um, so if someone is a member of the California Delta Chambers and Visitors Bureau, what kind of like services or offerings do you have for your membership? Yeah, great question, Stacy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, when you when you join, we create a listing for you on our website, CaliforniaDelta.org. We we actually we've had that ever pretty much since the uh, internet came to be um, for probably 30 years now or 20, whatever it is. But uh, so we create a listing for you on there. Um, you're invited to uh, all of our mixers and events that we have. We have a monthly mixer where we like to introduce new members and uh, get a feeling for what they do. And they can talk to some people that have been around and more experienced. Just as an instance, uh, last month, uh, we had a lady join that is uh, started a uh, boat detailing business. And uh, so I've been working with her. So uh, Vicki Bowman, who's the uh, manager of uh, Village West Marina overheard us talking. She says, oh, you know, we really need some, uh, some uh, boat detailers and give me your information and we'll have you come over to Village West. So just stuff like that happens all the time. We had another guy who was gonna build a, uh, a building and we have an architect member and they happen to be at the same mixer and we put them together. So it's like a win-win situation for everybody. But uh, so the other thing is uh, we have a monthly newsletter that we send out, electronic newsletter, Delta Scuttlebutt. And with that, we put uh, anybody that's interested that has an event going on, we'll include that event on the uh, newsletter. And then also we have a, a event page on our website where we include the mixers or anybody that has an event. Uh, the other thing we do when we've lost out the last couple of years, but generally we put on a wine, wine and food tasting event every year. And that has a lot of uh, uh, people besides members come and uh, local businesses. So there's, uh, and the other thing is we have a seven day a week hotline that our members or anybody else can call and we'll try to help them out over the phone. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. Okay. I know you also have your social media channels as well and you share. Oh, true your members yeah. information on there also, which can be a great way to help spread the word. Very true. Yeah, we have uh, a California Delta Facebook page, and then we've got a group, uh, same thing, California Delta uh, Chamber. And uh, on the, the group website, anybody can post, even if they're not a member, if it's something interesting and you know not offensive. Um, and then the, the chamber website itself, it's members and we'll include a few, you know, non-members once in a while too. But uh, yeah, so we have two Facebook pages. Great. Thank you very much. So as you can see, I mean, the benefits there of joining a chamber or visitors bureau, you really have somebody, you know, they're supporting you, knowing the locale, being able to you know, give business advice, create networking opportunities, help market and promote you. Um, so I encourage anybody who is um, looking for a new avenue to support their business or organization to, to look into their local and regional chambers. Now visitors bureaus may function a little bit differently. There may not be as much focus as I mentioned on like that business networking and um, promoting businesses specifically versus just general activities and events and things like that. But check with your visitors bureaus. They're in almost every locale. Again, they can be very local or they can be regional or statewide, for instance, um, and, and see what opportunities there are because um, you might be able to share events that you have coming up. You could do something like guest blog posts, sometimes just, you know, filtering information to those visitors bureaus that may be missing on their website that might help promote certain activities in your area, which will eventually bring in more tourists that might come to your business. So just kind of think that, think about these things in your mind look out, do some exploring online and um, see different ways that you might be able to get involved. Business chambers tend to be paid memberships um, generally versus um, maybe through visitors bureaus, you might have opportunities to 
share events for free, for instance. So it just again, if it I could depends. add, Stacy, uh, we we strive to keep our dues extremely low. So it's one hundred and sixty five dollars a year for any business, and uh, we think there's a huge value for that. We answer the phone seven days a week. We return emails seven days a week, and a lot, like you just mentioned, a lot of these people are visitors and are looking for lodging or restaurants. Uh, we get, we get a lot of call from, calls from boaters coming up the uh, river and get lost up there, and we try to help them find their way, uh, usually successfully. So, uh, but uh, yeah, we get involved. Like Latitude 38 magazine out of the Bay Area has got a, a Delta Doodah going on all summer, so we've been working with them. Um, we do whatever we can, donate prizes to, if we can uh, scrape them up and uh, uh, help out, you know, wherever we possibly can. So, Great, thank you. And just to let everybody know, I do support and, and run the Visit CA Delta um, website and social media. And when we get calls and emails that I can't answer about the Delta and about tourism and um, businesses or whatever it might be in the Delta, Bill is the one that I reach out to when I need support. So thank, thank you, you, Bill. I really appreciate you sharing a little bit about California Delta Chambers and Visitors Bureau with us today. My pleasure. Any other questions? I have a question for you, Bill. Badgie? I believe that was Bob. Bob, did you have a question? Yeah, just um, I've, I've caught a little bit of your activities there. And actually, we did, our, our chamber did a mixer at uh, Sugar Barge a couple months ago. And I think they mentioned you folks were coming in the week after us or the couple weeks later. And that just... Yeah, we, we had a uh, mixer at Sugar Barge too. We had we actually we had a Discovery Bay Yacht Club, uh, not at the Discovery Bay Chamber though. But yeah, we're always looking to hook up with anybody we can. Yeah, uh, Bill, could you or any any one of you could you just kind of explain the the organization? You're you're a collective of chambers within the Delta, and then wh where do your uh, events fall? Say just say the mixers from east to west. What's sort of the geographic range of what you're doing? Uh, yeah, that's that's a really good point. Uh, we yeah we try to we try to scatter our mixers around the whole delta. So we, we recently we were at Sugar Barge. Last month we were at uh, um, Windmill Cove in Stockton. Uh, this coming month we're going to return or cut right down the street. But uh, we have them in Isleton. Uh, we have literally we've had mixers all over the delta, and uh, we encourage you know like maybe a couple members to get to, to get together and hold a mixer, but they typically be 50 or 60 people uh, attend and it's a really good networking place. Last, last month, by the way, um, we, every, every year, uh, Band Delta Yachtsman Magazine gives out the Hal Shell Award in honor of our deceased good friend. And uh, last month uh, we gave it out at Windmill Cove to uh, Claude and Aaron Pellerin who've taken over uh, Village West Marina over the last few years and just transformed it into a garden. So um, whenever we can get involved in something like that, that's what we want to do. Sounds interesting. I'm, I'm going to have to make the effort to get out there and see what's going on with you guys. Yeah, let's communicate. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. I got the phone number right here. So I'll be sending this PowerPoint out uh, when we are done with this presentation. So you'll be able to get a hold of Bill. Thanks for the question, Bob. All right, we are going to move on because again, we have a lot to cover. I want to talk to you a little bit about listing directories and what they are, what the benefits are. Um, I mentioned it just a little bit because oftentimes chambers and visitors bureaus may have listing directories on their website. Um, and of course, we're, you know, the same benefits are going to keep coming up over and over. What is the point of marketing? For anything, whether it's directories, joining your chamber, having a website, amplify your presence online, improve your visibility to wider, wider audiences, increase your brand awareness, like get more engagement, have more people spend money, right? We know what all of those benefits are, but online listing directi directories can have some very specific, unique benefits. One of those is the word of mouth aspect, because many listing directories, and I'll give you examples, have reviews that are attached to the listings. Um, and that can be really powerful. 
it can be powerful in a negative way too. So we do want to be real careful, but the positive aspects really can support your business. Uh, being on online listing directories can also boost your search engine optimization or SEO. Um, we're going to talk about what that is a little bit, well, not much in depth, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth later. Um, but search engine optimization like helps get your, when someone's searching for something online and they put in like a specific keyword and they live in a certain area, if your website has good search engine optimization, it's going to come up higher on like the Google page, for instance, on like the first page of um, the search results. And there's a lot of algorithms that go into what makes for good search optimization. And one of them, just one of them, is how many other websites are linking to your website. So being on listing directories can help increase the amount of links that are going to your website. And the other thing is, is you have another potential avenue for showing up on Google if other websites are beating out your website when people are searching for certain terms. Because sometimes what will happen is if I'm looking for fishing in the Delta, for instance, um, you know, there may be a couple of bait shops that come up, but maybe there's a directory about fishing in the Delta. And though your business didn't come up on that home, you know, that first page of the search, it might come up via that listing directory on the first page of the search. So those are just a few unique benefits of making sure that you are on listing directories that are available out there. Some examples of listing directories. Now, Google and other search engines like Bing are actually listing directories, right? They're like the ultimate umbrella listing directory. So we're not going to go into that too much right now on how to engage with them as a listing directory. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more later in search engine marketing. Um, your chambers and visitors bureaus, as mentioned, if you have an opportunity to get your business listed there, either as a member or if they have another free avenue for listing your business. Um, then there's other ones that are really popular and also have the review aspect where people are reviewing your business, such as Nextdoor, Yelp, and TripAdvisor. Even if your business isn't specifically um, travel related, it's still good to be on something like TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor comes up so often in search engine um, results and you know, people are traveling and are going to be looking for something while they're out traveling, even if it's not, as I mentioned, travel specific um, kind of thing. So getting on these um, listing directories, especially these really popular ones, is kind of, um, it should be a high priority. And chances are you are probably already on them and you may not even know it. I'm going to talk about what to do about that in just a minute. Other examples of listing directories like the Best, Better Business Bureau. And then of course there's a million, millions of niche directories out there. Directories are specifically catering to your audience, your market, your business type. Um, and you can search for those online. There's a lot of options out there. Some of them are paid, many of them are free. Like Visit CA Delta. If you go to visitcadelta.com, we have a pretty massive Delta specific listing directory. There's, I think, 900 total listings in our directory scattered throughout our website across many categories. Right now, the listings are very simple. It's pretty much the name, the address, the phone number, and the website that uh, whatever the business has. Sometimes that's Facebook, sometimes it's an actual website, whatever it might be. Um, we do offer those listings for free. We're constantly trying to keep it updated as new businesses come online or go offline, unfortunately, which does happen. Um, making sure that you know the websites and phone numbers stay updated. We really encourage all of you who are with us today or watching this recording to go to visit cadelta.com and take a look around and make sure that your business or organization is listed on the website and to make sure your information is correct. 
And if you need to reach out to me, you'll have my contact information at the end of this. Um, you can let me know what changes or updates we need to do and we'll make sure it's on there. We'll make sure everything is uh, updated accordingly. Speaking of updates, let's talk a bit about some of the best practices around dealing with these listing directories. As I mentioned, you may be on listing directories and not even know it. And you wanna make sure that if you are on a listing directory somewhere that you take control of that listing if at all possible, particularly um, whatever free level, absolutely take control of it. Sometimes it will be totally free. Sometimes it'll be totally paid. Sometimes there's an option where it's free unless you wanna do more things and there's a paid version. So you kind of need to decide what makes sense for you as far as paying money um, you know, is it a really large, popular uh, listing directory? Do you already have a lot of reviews, for instance, or a lot of views on your listing? If so, then you might want to consider paying for the next levels, just things to consider. But one of the first things you should really be doing is getting online and actually searching for your business or organization. And don't just search the first one or two pages. I would go a little bit deeper all the way back through like the fourth or fifth page of the search results, um, just to see if your name is coming up on any listing pages, making sure that at absolute minimum, your listing information is at least correct. Even if it's a paid listing, if um, to like claim it, if you want to claim it, but you have to pay to claim it, at minimum, they should at least have your information correct if they're going to be listing it without your payment or even approval. So if they're asking you to claim it and pay for it in order to make changes, you should at least email them to make sure that you know your phone number, your website, your business name, those kinds of things are correct. Um, but do check to see if there's an opportunity to claim your listing on these listing pages. And then you can also go and find, as I mentioned, like these other types of listing pages that you want to be on that you're not on yet and either get a free listing or if you find it advantageous to pay for a listing. And once you do, then you can go to that next step by actually adding more information um, adding an about section, adding photos. You can do that on a lot of these listing examples that I mentioned on the previous slide. There's a lot more you can do um, often for free. And if you can get the better information, get better photos, there's a lot of people, who got, you know, a lot of traffic on some of these listing directory pages. So the more you can take control of your own listing, the more you can share on that listing, the better uh, you are going to be. If you are going to be really active uh, in especially paying for your listings, but you just make sure to, to keep them updated regularly. If you know you're changing your hours or you changed your website, you know, try to remember that you need to go through not just your website and your social media, but you need to go and actually check to make sure your information is correct on these listings. Usually what I'll do is I'll keep, you know, just a simple Excel document with the listing directories that I know that I'm on. So every six months or so, if I make a change to something, I can just pop on over. I got the logins and the passwords there ready to go, and I can quickly make the changes that I need to make. Um, this also kind of going back to like the search engines, Google and Bing, um, do make sure that like on the maps, especially where you are going to most likely be listed already, that your information is correct there, and you can change um, that basic information for free on like Google Maps. The other thing is for the listing directories that have reviews, you do want to be reading your reviews. It might be um, challenging to do sometimes, but you will learn a lot about how people are feeling about your business or potentially see patterns, um, either good or bad, that you can either address if are negative or you can capitalize on. If you're seeing trends of things that people are really enjoying, you know, you could promote that more, for instance. Um, but also it can be really good to respond to reviews. Be really careful when you respond to reviews. You should always respond in the most professional, courteous way possible. I'm sure all of you have probably seen a business response on Yelp or something that just 
didn't put them in the best of light. So if you are going to respond, for instance, to, you know, it happens, a negative review, um, the more pro professional you sound and the fact that you're responding at all actually um, makes people trust you more. Um, you never want to ignore bad reviews or negative comments like on social media. It's always better to respond. Just keep it simple, keep it light, keep it professional, try to fix the problem if you can. Uh, and then as I mentioned <clears throat> already to go ahead and, and research those other directories that target your specific audience and your business, like get out there. It's going to help you reach more people. It's going to help your search engine optimization. So your website comes up on search results <clears throat> more, excuse me. So there's a lot of benefits here and the return on investment can be great because again, a lot of this is often free. Stacy, forgive me. I'm going to uh, sign off. Thank you very much, folks, for allow allowing me to be here. Uh, my wife just arrived and wants me to take her out to dinner. So, Thank you, Bill. Enjoy dinner. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, moving on. So again, this is a mixed bag workshop. We are covering a number of topics today. And the next one that we're going to be talking about is email marketing. Some of you may have heard people say like email is old, email is out, nobody uses email anymore. I've heard it a number of times. It's not true. <laughs> email is here. It's probably going to be here for a very long time and it just continues to grow in users. So email campaigns has a higher return on investment more than any other marketing category. So the money and the time typically that you spend developing email com campaigns and the amount of people you can reach and the way that they engage really has a really strong positive tie. Before I go into what some of the other best practices are that you can utilize, around email campaigns, I do want to make sure you understand that there are actual anti-spam laws that are out there regarding email campaigns, marketing via email. And so I have a link here that I highly recommend that you read if you're already doing any kind of email marketing or if you plan on doing any kind of email marketing. There's a lot to digest on that page. So I am going to focus on just a couple of quick things. Rule number one, the biggest rule, do not send emails to people who have not opted in. You want people to opt in either to come into your place of business and write their email down so you can send them something to go to your website and put their email in that way, whatever it is, People who have opted in are just more interested in your product or service and your chance for them engaging with you is just exponentially higher anyway. Those are the people you want to be interacting with, the people who have opted in. But if you're sending emails to people who have not opted in, who have not allowed you, given permission for you to send marketing emails to them, there's a whole number of things that can happen, including having your email blacklisted, um, but also potentially running up against these CAN spam act um, aspects as well, where you might potentially have legal challenges, especially if you're you're really spending uh, sending you know, like really egregious in mass. <laughs> um, it can cause a lot of problems. For instance, if you send out uh, an email to 300 people and many of them have no idea who you are. They didn't you know, want your email and ask for it. And you have a bunch of them who mark you as spam, your email service provider or the provider who runs your email campaigns could end up, like I said, blacklisting your email. So you're not able to even send out from your email address to anybody 
anymore or they're you know not going to receive your emails so there's a lot of ramifications for not following the rules when it comes to email marketing so please don't just jump in buy email lists from somewhere or you know just grab emails that you have from some you know event or something but it didn't have to do with them opting in to your newsletter like you need to make sure that you have permission to send these emails for a lot of reasons um, another thing is you need to use a service platform. If you're sending marketing emails or you're sending emails in mass, when I say in mass, I can't give you a specific number, but just in mass, um, you really want to be using a service platform. I'll give you some examples of what's out there. You absolutely do not want to send marketing emails or emails in mass from your personal email address. Because again, you could lose the ability to continue using that email address if your email server catches on to what's going on. Aside from the fact that you could also be going up against the scam spam act as well. All right, so now that we have that covered and that's in your mind and you're gonna make sure that you read this information before you delve into the world of email campaigns, let's take a look at what's out there for you. <clears throat> so I talked about, um, a service provider, not using your specific emails. So things like Constant Contact, MailChimp, Send in Blue, Get Response, ConvertKit, and many, many more that are out there are set up to help you reach your target audience via marketing efforts uh, through their services. And so they'll help you manage your list. They'll help you get those opt-ins. They're going to help you create you know, beautiful, dynamic, emails that are engaging because they have templates. Um, they have a ton of resources that they can offer to, to show you how to write the content and um, you know, write the best headlines. You can set up different types of lists. So maybe you have a weekly list that goes out that's like an educational resource, general information with a little bit of marketing in there because uh, we always like those calls to action. Um, and, you know, maybe you have another list that's just people who are interested in your, your monthly sales and that goes out once a month. So whatever it may be, these service providers really help with the end to end aspect of email marketing. Most of them, not all of them are pretty intuitive and typically easy to work with and, and get set up. I've used most of these in one form or another. Um, if you're a smaller business. Some of these are even free. So if you're sending out like, I think less than 2000 emails a month, for instance, uh, MailChimp, you can do that for free and you can have multiple lists and you can have uh, pretty much all of the, the major email campaign services that you would have if you were paying for it. I've used Constant Contact forever. It does not have a free option. Again, I'm not endorsing it. It's just kind of the one that I started using and have ended up using the most. I do um, think as a platform, it's very intuitive um, in particular. I think it's personally the most intuitive, um, but I would say if you're a smaller business with a smaller list and you were looking for the best free option that you might wanna do some more research into MailChimp, um, that would be my recommendation. So these are all again, I'm not saying you should try anyone in particular, because even though I, I kind of recommend, you know, MailChimp as a great free option, um, I like Constant Contact as a paid option. It may not be best for you in your business. So this is just a place to get started for you that you can look into the comparisons, the pricing, um, and the different options that are out there to see what would actually meet your needs for your business. Now, once you kind of pick your platform, there are some best practices. There are many, many more than the six that I have here, but this is just to kind of get you started thinking about your email campaigns. One of those is to avoid using the no reply. We've all seen it in the sender's email address. Um, use your business name and use an email people can actually respond to. Um, it's so common to get an email and it seems really interesting and you have a question about it, 
but it's a no reply, right? Because it's just not monitored. They're just sending out this email. They want you to take the information and go to their website and spend the money, but they're not making it easy and accessible for you to, to follow up or ask more questions. Um, as a smaller business or organization, especially, I really recommend that when you're setting up your accounts and you're setting up um, your templates on these service providers that you make sure, you know, it's your full business name that comes up on the email line. And that again, you are using an email that people can actually respond to if they want to follow up or have more questions. The next thing is to practice good design, uncluttered quality photos, easy to read fonts and colors. Um, the nice thing is that email campaign designs uh, or design is a lot like website design. And I covered a lot of website design aspects in workshop number one. So you will have a link if you weren't in that workshop at the end of this one, you can go back to workshop number one and learn about um, avoiding the sparkly unicorn. I'm not gonna get into that. I want you to go take a look at it yourself. Um, but there's a lot of good information on there on practicing good design. And again, most of these service providers do have templates set up that are just like drag and drop, but even still, um, you can get crazy with those fonts and lots of colors and background images and low quality photos that you can very quickly ruin uh, a simple template. So <laughs> you just want to get your information across in a way that's engaging, but also easy for people to consume. The next one is to write compelling but concise subject lines and content. You don't need to write paragraphs and paragraphs in the text of your email. People have, you know, pretty limited attention spans for this kind of thing. You want to capture their attention, get the most important information that you can, um, get that action item in there, like click here, buy now, um, whatever it might be, give us a call, whatever the action is, to get them moved on to the next step. That is the goal here. Um, buy now is a good one. Good goal. <laughs> um, but those subject lines, you want to make sure that they're capturing people's attention. One of the rules in the CAN Spam Act is to not practice deceptive uh, marketing in your subject lines. So you don't want to have a subject line that has nothing to do with what is actually in your email. Um, not only is it going to make your readers pretty upset and and kind of have them view in negative light you could potentially be going up against these legal um, aspects around email marketing and there's a whole art to subject lines so if you really find that you love sending out email campaigns i do recommend doing some research on creating engaging subject lines um, there's a lot of great information out there as I mentioned, you can have different lists for different audiences. So I do recommend making sure that you're not just always sending out you know, different types of emails all to just one group. It's really great to find ways to segment so you're reaching the right people in the right ways. Uh, also, don't be too salesy. This is something you should practice on, on pretty much every platform, whether it's your website, social media, email marketing. If you're all sales all the time, if it's all here's our product, buy it all the time, um, people are going to get bored. You need to be able to mix it up a little bit to share interesting information, to capture people's attention in different ways, share your story, whatever it might be. Um, try to mix it up a little bit so it's not just, hey, come in and um, buy this product today. The other thing I recommend is to be consistent. With this, I want to say the chances are you really don't need to send out more than one email per week to a list. Any more than that is probably going to be overkill. Um, if you are doing something that has kind of an educational resource aspect to it, um, try to send out at the same day every time at least, you know, or not least, but once a week. Um, that can be really beneficial in keeping people engaged. But then if you're just doing things where it's like, you know, you're doing a monthly sale at the spur of the moment, or you have an event coming up, um, you know, it's okay to send out every now and again. 
if you don't have a consistent like weekly email that you're sending out and you're only sending out emails every now and again, try to find a way to, to not have too much time go by. Um, you know, sending out an email one month and then three months goes by and you send out another one and then, you know, a week goes by and you send out another one just kind of all over the place, not going to benefit you. So if there's any way that you can bring more consistency to getting out your emails, you're going to be better off. All right, we are moving on to SMS marketing. Actually, before I do, I know I said there's going to be question time at the end, but, you know, we have a little bit of time. Did anybody have any questions on anything I've talked about so far? All right. All right. So SMS marketing. Um, how many people in here, you can raise your hand, like get SMS text messages from like their favorite business or anything? Okay, so, you know, this was something that wasn't that popular not that long ago, and it is ramping up more and more. It's good for very specific things. SMS marketing is basically sending promotional campaigns, um, transactional messages, marketing uh, efforts through text messages. And you know, it's, it's great for doing things like offering coupons, promoting sales, announcing products, um, sending updates or notifications, creating appointment reminders, collecting customer feedback. Um, these are kind of the main things that people are gonna use SMS marketing for, text message marketing. And there are benefits to it because it is a growing industry. More and more people are on mobile. They're viewing your website on mobile. They're on social media on mobile. Um, I know, for instance, our Visit CA Delta website, uh, depending on the quarter, it just depends, but usually 70% roughly of the visitors to the Visit CA Delta website are viewing on their phone. And so SMS is just a great way to reach where everybody is. Um, it also has a higher open rate than emails. It can be very cost effective. I just mentioned it's as mobile friendly as you can get. You reach a wide demographic. Everybody gets text messages. Um, it works with other types of marketing. So there's opportunities to link to your social media, link to your website, whatever it might be. It's a fastest delivery that's really available on the market to get your message in front of somebody. It can help strengthen customer engagement, particularly because customers can and should be opting in. And again, anytime they're making that choice to engage with you, you're gonna be able to strengthen that relationship with the customer. So these best practices are, are very similar to the best practices for email campaigns. You really need to, again, get permission. You cannot be sending text to people who haven't asked for you to send them text messages, um, especially considering the fact that, you know, some people have to pay for incoming text messages. So you really need to be careful about that. And you also need to make sure that when you're sending out these text messages, again, through service providers, which we'll talk about, um, that you're giving people an opportunity to easily quickly opt out so they don't keep getting the messages if they don't want them anymore. You do need to use SMS marketing services just like you need to use email platform campaign services. Um, you can't be sending marketing or mass text via your own personal or business phone. Uh, make it valuable. It needs to be, you know, it, Text messages can really uh, get annoying pretty quickly, right? And lose value very quickly. I think we all have experienced this, even with businesses that we value and appreciate. Um, it needs to offer them something. It needs to be click here for your 20% off. Um, you need to be able to really give them something on a regular basis in order to keep their attention and to make it worthwhile for them to continue receiving your text messages. The next one is include personalization. And again, as I'm going through these, think of these as good email 
um, campaign best practices as well. Um, it would be great to get an email that says, and there was kind of an example on the last slide. Hey, Stacy, happy birthday. Here's your 20% off, right? It's more personal. So you, there's ways to, when you have your lists and you have people's names to kind of program that in, you don't have to do that individually. It's set up through the service provider to be able to create that personalization. And of course, keep it short, get to the point, consider timing. There are best practices around when to send out email campaigns and when to send out SMS text messages. Um, there is a very specific time, but it's roughly before uh, lunch, like a half an hour before noon, and then starting like a half an hour after one um, until about 3.30 p.m. is kind of the good times there. Um, but you do want to consider when those are being sent out. Um, don't use slang or abbreviations. Use language like you're actually in front of the person and talking to them, um, like you, like in a very personal manner. Identify yourself. They may not know who the text message is coming from. It might just come up as a number. This is Michael's. I get those a lot at the Michael's Craft Store. <laughs> I always know exactly quickly who that's coming in from. Uh, don't be too salesy. Again, this goes with all your marketing platforms. Try to switch it up a little bit. Like that birthday one is great. Um, that personalizing versus, you know, just constantly sending the same um, buy this product now text message. And of course, don't send too many texts. You need to do your research on this as well. Um, and of course, you know, there is going to be this monetary aspect to um, sending out text messages. So usually, you know, per text is what you're paying for. So that may limit how many texts you can send out. Anyway, um, and then again, you're always looking to include that call of action. You're not just sharing information. You want to give them that link or whatever it may be to move them on to the next step. Let them know what they should be doing next and give them the opportunity to make that next step. Uh, there is so much more to SMS marketing, especially because it's a really gr quickly growing area and we only have so much time today. Um, so I did put a link here. I did research on a number of different sites that I thought might be useful for you. I really liked this one. It goes a lot more in depth to best practices. There's a lot more information. Um, it also talks about some of the SMS service providers. I don't have as much experience in SMS marketing, so I didn't feel as comfortable um, sharing different service providers that are currently out there, um, like I did with the email campaign. So um, there are opportunities through this link to begin some of that process. Um, I did notice that some of the service providers that they listed, I, I have some familiarity with, so I felt pretty good sharing this link. So again, really do the research yourself, but this is to, to get you thinking about the possibilities are out there and kind of get you maybe on a different track if you haven't been doing this kind of stuff before for your marketing efforts. Any questions before I move on? Stacey, what provider are you using on the Delta website? For SMS? Yeah, you've got a, you've got a widget there from looks like. Uh, no, I'm not using SMS marketing. That's just, a, that's just an opt-in form? Yes, and that is for our email campaign. And uh, I do use Constant Contact okay. for that. I happen but to know I an use... SMS provider if you have a need. Uh, yeah, I don't. And in fact, we are looking into that, but we are looking um, at an organization that caters specifically to government entities. It's called mm -hmm. Granicus. And we're just starting to look into that as a possible option, both for our email campaign and our SMS services. And that is something I wanted to mention that there are service or platforms out there that do both. So you can find one that manages your list that will allow you to send out both SMS and email campaigns. So you can take a look at that. Um, but there's also platforms out there that will kind of connect and talk with each other. So you might have a different SMS platform, but you can kind of tie it with constant contact and they'll kind of you know talk and work together. So there's options like that out there as well. So I currently am not running any SMS marketing at this time. I'm working on it. 
we, we started using that in our local chamber and finding it's quite popular and people are getting a lot of good inbound comments on that. That is great to hear. I would love if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more, like how are you using SMS through the chamber? Um, mostly event notifications. Um, we're just keeping it simple. So, um, for example, we had a mixer a couple of evenings ago and we just have a sign up sheet there. Um, if we have community music events or uh, I think they're doing a garage sale in a couple of months or any sort of chamber related event, we just give people the opportunity to sign up. That's I, I happen to manage it for them. So we just will do a blast coming up because as you mentioned, the open rates are 90% plus, 95% plus versus 30% on average open rates on, on emails. That's perfect, Bob. Thank you so much for sharing that. Do, would you mind sharing who you utilize? Uh, I have my own marketing platform. It does, it, it's kind of all inclusive. We gotcha. do gotcha. email, SMS, websites, landing pages, whatever. It's all, it's all in one dashboard. Nice. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. 90, 95% open rate. I mean, that's massive. Email campaigns of the return on investment is high with the people who do engage with the email. Um, it is not uncommon to have much lower open rates and click through rates. Uh, we run anywhere from 20 to 30% on average, which is generally considered really high for email campaign, you know, kind of general larger email campaign open rates. It does depend on the industry, um, but as Bob mentioned, um, to be able to quickly reach that many people. I'm, I'm curious, do you know what your click-through rates are? If, if you share links specifically? On the email side or the SMS side? Uh, on the SMS side. Yeah, the SMS side, I try and keep, I, I try and just keep the, uh, there's not a direct call to action with links on there. Um, mm -hmm. There's a whole, issue going on with carriers are really kind of, you know, email got turned into a spammy mess over the years. The carriers are trying to get in front of that on the SMS side. So it's kind of in an evolving situation. So we try and keep links out to the extent that we can. I see. Okay, great. Well, thank you for sharing some of your personal experience with that. And I love that. What a great way to get events in front of people. The other nice thing about text messaging, especially in the Delta, where people struggle to have good broadbands um, and may you know have some internet access, they're much more likely to be able to receive your text messages. It's a lot easier to get data through. All right. Okay, as mentioned, I was going to discuss search engine marketing. And I got to tell you, we could spend hours and hours on search engine marketing. So like everything else, this is just a high level overview to kind of get you thinking, get you pointed in the right direction. You can always reach out to me later if you have more questions or need more resources. I'm happy to um, provide that support. So search engine marketing is paid or unpaid digital marketing in any search engine like Google or Bing with the aim to achieve a high ranking for a specific keyword or keyword phrase. As I talked about earlier, someone might be looking for Delta fishing or fishing in the Delta. Fishing in the Delta is an example of a keyword phrase. Um, they're gonna put that keyword phrase in. Most likely that search engine is gonna know the location of the person putting in that keyword phrase. It's gonna perform a bunch of algorithms uh, or it's gonna perform a algorithm that has a bunch of different components and it's gonna pop up search results um, that are related to hopefully phishing in the California Delta and websites that might be beneficial for the person searching. And what you can do is you can take efforts through both paid and unpaid channels and ways to increase your ability to come up high on that first page when people are searching for keyword terms or phrases that relate to your business. One of those ways is to go through the process of organic search engine 
marketing efforts. And that's really where search engine optimization comes in. That is all of the things that you can do to make it so that the search engine algorithms really see your website as the best viable option for the person searching for those terms. Um, and there is a lot to search engine optimization. It's a big wide world. One of the main things that people know about and think of when it comes to search engine uh, optimization is using those keywords and keyword phrases like in your website, in your headers, throughout your text, so that when somebody searches for that keyword, hopefully your website's more likely to pop up. These algorithms are smart. It used to be that people would then just take random keywords and just start throwing them all over their website. Eventually, the search engines kind of realized what was going on and you know, ding people now who try to use keyword terms that don't actually relate to their business. Um, but knowing what your business is about, knowing what you're trying to convey can help you figure out what keywords you should be using and things like your headers and throughout your text on your website. There are searches that you can do online to see what terms people are actually searching for and how many other businesses and websites are using those terms. Um, that alone, I mean, you can spend hours doing nothing but trying to optimize your keywords. Um, but it is a good thing to start looking into because it's a quick and easy way to at least get a leg up. I mean, just having a few key terms placed in the right place on your website can take a few minutes and can make the difference of being on the second or third page and being on the first, depending, again, on your business and how much competition you have kind of within your area too. Um, so that's part of it also is the algorithms are looking at location. They're looking at these keywords. They're looking at how many websites are linking to you and how many times you're mentioned, um, your name is mentioned. And there's a lot that go into these algorithms. Um, so making sure that other websites like listing directories are linked to you and picking out one or two really strong keywords to use on your website is a good place to start to dip your toe in the water when it comes to organic SEM. So you want good SEO for your SEM. Um, I have another link that I put in here that I thought would be a really good resource for you. There's a lot of information on here. Um, I, you can hire people out. Um, to do search engine optimization for your website. And depending on what your goals are, if you get a lot of search traffic and you find that um, you know, you're getting more customers that way versus other ways, it, it may behoove you to pay somebody to do this. But no matter what, I do recommend that if you have a website and you, you do any marketing yourself, that just learning at least some of the basics. Um, so you can do some of those things, or at least so you can potentially hire someone and you have enough background knowledge so you can hire somebody to, to do this for you. Uh, so please take a look at that link. That's an option there to learn a little bit more. The next aspect of search engine marketing is paid marketing. So you have organic marketing and paid marketing. And paid marketing on search engines, um, typically, not always, is gonna be pay per click, PPC advertising. And generally how that works is you'll kind of pay to have your business pop up higher. And sometimes we even say advertisement. Um, you've probably seen that on Google. Um, when people put in certain keywords, particularly in, a, in like a location, like um, the Delta, Sacramento, California, whatever it may be. And then you're only paying when somebody clicks on that advertisement. So that's nice because, um, you know, sometimes you pay for advertising, you put it out there in the world, and you, you don't even know sometimes if anybody has seen it. Um, so this can be a great option, but you know, it can, you can set budgets, for instance, um, and typically you're gonna find this pay-per-click advertising option through Google Ads. 
um, or like Microsoft advertising for Bing. Those are kind of the two major areas that you're probably going to look into search engine marketing. Of course, there's lots of other options out there. Um, but again, this is also a big wide world. And if you're going to do pay per click advertising, I really recommend that you already have done some of the legwork around researching keywords, um, getting your search engine optimization under control first before you move into pay-per-click advertising because you're going to just be a lot better off. Um, there's a lot of resources on Google when you go to Google Ads around all of this that you can read into more. Again, we are kind of running out of time here and I just this is just the highest level overview that this exists. <laughs> it is something that I highly recommend you look into and I highly recommend you start thinking about and integrating even in the simplest ways for your marketing efforts. And again, I will send out this PowerPoint so you're gonna have access to all of these links. Last but not least, we're going to talk a little bit about guerrilla marketing. It's a little bit more fun. It's a little bit less internet-y. And uh, <laughs> it's really a creative way to capture people's attention and leave a memorable impression in ways that like they're not accustomed to. A lot of people are used to getting their emails and their SMS and going to websites and you know, advertising is just coming in from everywhere. and they get you know, desensitized, we get desensitized to marketing efforts. And so guerrilla marketing can be a great way to break through all of that noise. Um, examples, uh, the sky's the limit here. So like these are some examples to get you thinking about like what it could be. Like creating a funny video for your business that might go viral. Um, the sidewalk chalk art down the street that somehow you know, points to your business placing your products out in the world in unexpected places, flash mobs, treasure hunts, literally someone dressed as a gorilla walking down the street with a sign. I mean, just, you know, things that are just like unexpected, different, creative ways. There are so many ways to do gorilla marketing out there. There's examples that are surprising, that are cheap, that are easy. The benefits are great because um, it can be free almost. Um, and again, there is no limit to how creative you can get with guerrilla marketing. Um, whatever your idea might be, it might be something you can execute and try. Um, it grows with word of mouth. Uh, when people find these unexpected instances, they do like to tell the story and share it with other people. And also publicity. Uh, can you can actually you know capture the attention of like traditional media outlets and now instead of capturing a few people walking down the street in Rio Vista you're on the Sacramento news or something and now people are coming to visit you um, but there are cons to guerrilla marketing uh, sometimes you know the messages that you're trying to get out there through these like highly creative nuanced ways can be misunderstood um, people might not know exactly what's going on, might not even tie it to your business. Um, but the other thing, the real cons that you absolutely have to be careful about is um, guerrilla marketing can definitely go against local ordinances and, and even laws. You need to be careful with that. And depending on what you do and how you do it, there could be like backlash. It could be viewed in a negative way. It could be viewed as, you know, this business is, um, not being very, it's like trying too hard, it's not being very authentic, or um, maybe the message that you put out doesn't go across very well, or, or maybe you kind of went into these areas where you maybe were breaking an ordinance or, or did something that maybe offended a lot of people. Um, so you, you do, you know, need to be careful. And I highly recommend if you're planning on doing any kind of guerrilla marketing effort, that you do run your ideas through like multiple, at minimum, if you're not hiring any kind of professionals, multiple friends and family members, <laughs> just to get some kind of feedback on, you know, how they might feel if they ran into this thing that you're doing. <clears throat> and you may or may not want to reach out to whoever oversees your local ordinances to um, see how much trouble someone might get into if, you know, they did a big chalk drawing in the middle of the street. I don't know. Whatever your idea is, it's good to think through it um, before just going out 
and doing it. There's a lot of examples of guerrilla marketing efforts out there. You can just type in guerrilla marketing and start getting some informa uh, inspiration there. Um, so that's the last major thing that I wanted to cover. Again, as I mentioned, this is a mixed bag. The first workshop was all about websites and the importance of websites, um, best practices, everybody should have a website. The second workshop, we really focused on all the many aspects of social media and the value that you can have there. Everybody should be on social media at this point. We did our in-person marketing workshop for our third workshop. And then we want to just give you, you know, just some of these other things that you can do. I know that this can be so overwhelming. Sometimes if you are um, you know, you're one person sometimes running a business or organization, um, or you're a very small organization, and it just feels like there's just so much to do. Um, I recommend starting with your website and our social media, um, and eventually coming around to these kinds of things here and there. And I like to practice something called minimum effective dose. You don't have to do everything. Sometimes just doing a little bit can be enough. And you can grow over time with these things. You can change over time the direction that you're going with some of these things. You may find out that you know trying one of these things really, really works. And then you can stop doing some of the other stuff and focus more over here. So I just encourage you to think broader about your marketing efforts to try out a few more things, um, you know, to know that there are a lot of free resources and opportunities that are out there for you. And, you know, to just play and explore as much as possible. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? All right. Okay. So I do have recordings available up right now for uh, one and two. I highly recommend you go back to one and check out uh, the information about design. Again, if you're planning to do any kind of um, email campaigns, it's incredibly important to not um, visually offend your audience. <laughs> and uh, so two is also up around social media. There's so much good information in both of these. Uh, around storytelling, building your audience, because all of that stuff that you do in websites and social media is going to help and support you when you move into some of these things that I talked about today. Um, In-person marketing will be up right around the same time that this mixed bag workshop recording will be up, so you'll be able to get um, all of these together here within the next couple of weeks. I will send an email out to everybody um, soon that has the PowerPoint and some resource lists, and then I'll send an email out again when the remainder, uh, remainder of the recordings are up, so you can take a look at those. And please share these. Um, there's so much information jam-packed into these. Um, if you know anybody who has a business or organization, even if they're uh, not necessarily in the Delta, it's not all Delta specific by any means, um, I hope you'll, you'll share this free information with them. So as mentioned, I'm with Delta Protection Commission and we run, I just kind of support oversee, I'm not sure the best word there, uh, the Visit CA Delta platform. Uh, well, the aim of Visit CA Delta is to spread awareness of the California Delta as a world-class tourism destination. It's filled with history, cultural richness. There's so much to do in the Delta. It's a great place both for locals and people from out of the region to play and explore in. Um, it's really an effort, um, not just from us, the Delta Protection Commission, the work that I do, um, but there's a lot of people involved in Visit CA Delta through the Delta Marketing Task Force. So we have Martha with us today from the Delta Conservancy. They're part of the Marketing Task Force. Bill, who spoke earlier at, uh, from the Delta Chambers and Visitors Bureau is part of the Marketing Task Force, as well as many other residents, um, organization leaders, business owners that all work with us to develop the website, develop marketing materials, run the social media and get the word out about how awesome the Delta is. We want people coming into the Delta and then coming to your businesses and organizations. So I hope that you'll join us on social media. 
check out our website. Again, check for your listings on our website, visit cidelta.com. Like us and follow us on social media. We're always sharing lots of information and we use the hashtag regularly, visit CA Delta. I do want to remind everybody that one of our favorite projects is the Best of the Delta Survey. It is the fifth annual Best of the Delta Survey this year. It closes this Saturday at 5 p.m. People can vote on all of these categories. This has been a really popular year. We have a ton of people who have participated in this survey. You still have time. So if you haven't already, please go in and vote for your favorite restaurants, art galleries, fishing spots, if you want to share it, whatever it might be. Um, this allows us to um, really showcase literally the best of the Delta, um, make sure these businesses are being recognized for um, their amazing offerings, make sure people know about these wonderful locations um, and really get the word out again, both locally and um, you know, throughout California and beyond. And then if you are interested in all of this, if you love the Delta and you love supporting the regional economy and you love marketing, I highly recommend you join the Delta Marketing Task Force. There's absolutely room for you. We are going to be having a meeting coming up in the next couple of months where we're going to be talking about um, in depth the recreation and tourism chapter update of the economic sustainability plan for the Delta. There's a lot of really interesting information and data that's been compiled about recreation and tourism in the Delta that we're able to share in this chapter update and share with you. It might be a benefit. And there's also opportunities for um, potential projects that could meet um, some of the, the things that have come up through that chapter update. And then the marketing task force has already started some discussion on our next low cost marketing efforts. So there's an opportunity to get involved in sharing your ideas on what we should do next for Visit CA Delta. We're always doing something and there's always ways to get involved. And that is it. So again, I am Stacy Hayden. You can find me here at stacy.hayden at delta.ca.gov. You can call me anytime. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, about Delta Protection Commission, about Visit CA Delta, or about any topic that we covered today. So even if it's just a general marketing question, I'm happy to help out any business or organization in the Delta. I just want to thank everybody for being here today. Again, this will be recorded, so I hope you'll have a chance to share this with others. Thank you. <laughs>